Okay, I think we'll start the webinar now. Uh, most people seem to be on the webinar and uh, we've got a very high attendance today for a return to Portugal. Um, and it's uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have uh, Terzo Alathabal from MDME Lawyers. He's uh, in Hong Kong and uh, obviously Terzo, we worked together a number of times on, on webinars and great to see you recently in, in Hong Kong. How are you? Hi, Grant. Great to see you as well. Uh, well, things are getting a little bit cooler here in Hong Kong at the moment, and like when I saw you last time uh, a couple of weeks ago. So all good, and thank you very much for having me uh, tonight again. It's great to have you on the webinar, Terzo, and uh, it's certainly a lot colder here in the UK than uh, Hong Kong, yeah. that's for sure. <laughs> so enjoy, enjoy that uh, that weather, regardless that it's a little bit cooler. So um, yeah, so look, great to uh, great to see you. Um, and yeah, welcome everybody. So today we're gonna be talking about um, Portugal, uh, two aspects. One is Terzo is going to do a presentation on the D7 visa opportunity, a really strong uh, visa opportunity for those of you who are considering um, long-term residence in Portugal. Um, and on my side, I will be doing um, an overview of the Portuguese property market, um, looking at high level data uh, in terms of supply v demand, uh, how the property market is fixed there at the moment. And that's uh, with, a, with a, a view to our, our upcoming launch in Porto in Portugal, where we have launched uh, previously um and uh, have had a, a successful um projects on the ground in porto that have just recently completed um so first first up let's get into the presentation um and let me first up give you a little bit of background to ip global because i know there's a lot of people on the webinar today who uh, are not so familiar with ip global so let me just share a bit of background first of all myself um so I've been with IP Global for 16 years, um, predominantly based in Hong Kong and Singapore. I relocated to the UK about a year ago. I'm just outside of uh, Cambridge now, and I, I trip out to Asia three or four times a year. Um, so I've been in the business pretty much since we set up. Um, and within the business, we have transacted on over three billion US dollars of property investment during that time across 18 countries, and we have sold over 6,000 properties. So we are a very experienced property investment company um, across numerous markets with offices in Hong Kong, here in the UK, uh, in, in the Middle East, uh, presence in South Africa uh, and, uh, and China as well. Um, so let's get into the next slide, please, Bella. So in terms of track record, um, we've done significant amounts of investment in a number of different markets. We've highlighted these on the screen here. Um, in our earlier days, it was Australia and the US, where we've done over 350 million US dollars of property investment. Right now, our focus is Portugal, it's Germany, and it's the UK. Germany, we've done over 150 million USD of property investment. Uh, a great uh, market with tax benefits. Um, the UK uh, is our biggest market where we've done over 115 projects since 2009. That's just under 2 billion US dollars of property investment. Next slide, please, Bella. So the key aspect of the business is the business model. Um, it's quite a unique business model. Um, we are not a marketing agent. We actually underwrite our deals, our property deals. What does that mean? Well, what that means is when we identify an opportunity, we get into price negotiation with, with developers. If we agree pricing, we actually commit capital. So we put down large deposits on each and every unit we secure. Um, and the developer builds the project and we sign a legal agreement carrying the sales risk. And that means that Whatever we haven't sold to our clients, by the time the building is built, we have to buy with our own capital. So clients know that if they don't purchase, we have to purchase anything that's not sold. So that gives us very strong credibility that we genuinely believe in our product. Um, 
But, but in essence, because we are putting down large amounts of capital at outset and we're not a multinational business, we have a limited amount of funds. So we need to be very diligent where we invest that money. So we rely heavily on our research team to bring the best opportunities. And consequently, we don't do many projects. It's very much we are very selective on what we launch before we come to market. And we try to de-risk our opportunities as much as we possibly can. Um, so next slide, please, Bella. So once we launch a project, we can introduce a client to the lawyers. We have access to uh, mortgage financing. We can do everything around the lettings and management process. And actually, we can also eventually sell the property that the client has purchased from us at the appropriate time. So it is very much an end-to-end -end business model. And we've got around about 30% of our clients have got more than one property with us. So it's very much about trying to build a strong long-term relationship with our investors. Next slide, please, Bella. Okay, so here's the, um, uh, the menu for today in terms of the uh, presentation. So Terzo will shortly um, be talking about um, the D7 visa, the opportunity with the D7 visa and how that works. Um, I will be giving a quick high level overview of the Portuguese housing market ahead of our new launch in Porto. And then there'll be a chance for Q&A at the end of the webinar. Um, so at that point, if I hand over to uh, Terzo to um, provide um, a bit of background to um, the D7 visa. And as I say, just to share with you, I've, I've worked with Terzo for, for many years. He's been in Hong Kong for many years, helping many clients with regard to visas in, uh, in Portugal. And it's great to have someone with his experience on the call today to share details on this opportunity. So again, Terzo, thank you for joining and I'll hand over to you at this point. Thank you very much. I think um, we can pass this first slide. Uh, yeah, so uh, um, just to, to briefly uh, let you know that uh, I am uh, a partner uh, at MDME Lawyers. Uh, I'm heading our private client practice, okay? Uh, and um, we focus mainly on foreign uh, investment into Portugal, uh, which includes uh, tax planning, uh, real estate investment, uh, and immigration matters such as uh, visas of uh, all types of visas that involve uh, Portugal. Um, I think that we can pass to the next slide. Uh, we are going to talk today about the, the D7 visa. The D7 visa is just one of the visas that uh, uh, exists in Portugal. Uh, the D7 visa is uh, commonly known as a retirement visa or uh, um, a passive income visa. Uh, it was created uh, in uh, 2007 by the Portuguese government and uh, it allows non-EU citizens to get Portuguese residency provided that they can uh, prove that they have uh, a certain level of uh, uh, passive income. Um, so as I told you before, this is ideal not only for retirees, but also for all of those that are not yet retired, but have a sufficient amount of passive income that will allow them to apply for, uh, for this visa. Um, the D7 applicant, uh, well, is entitled to apply for a temporary residency permit, okay? which uh, can then be converted to a permanent residency after five years, or even to apply for full Portuguese citizenship after five years of holding this D7 visa. We can pass to the next slide, please. So the main man benefits of uh, the Portuguese D7 visa are uh, the, the opportunity to freely travel within the Schengen area uh, without uh, any visa, um, to live and work uh, in Portugal, uh, to benefit from the Portuguese healthcare and the judicial system as well, uh, to have certain tax benefits in Portugal, uh, and it also allows people to bring in their family. Uh, so with the one visa, uh, they can include uh, uh, certain members of the family within, within the, the D7. 
we can pass maybe to the next slide. So what are the main requirements uh, to obtain this D7? First of all, uh, to be a non-EU uh, uh, national. Um, you will have to open also a bank account in Portugal, and for that you will need to obtain as well a tax number in Portugal uh, to open that bank account where you will have to put a certain amount of money that shows that you have a means of subsistence. This is normally equivalent uh, to a full year of minimum salaries in Portugal. The minimum salary in Portugal at the moment is around 800 euros. Uh, but of course, the more you can show uh, in this bank account, the smoother the application will be. Um, you will have to, to, to hold passive income. Of course, this is the nature of this visa. Uh, and like many others, investment visas and so on, this is a, a passive income or an income visa. So you need to show that you have passive income or uh, uh, pension uh, funds that are equivalent of at least per month, one minimum salary in Portugal, again, 800 euros. Or, um, I repeat, if you can show that the passive income is more than this, the better. Um, for that, you will have to make, uh, sorry, don't pass the slide. You will need to show uh, the, your last six months um, uh, of uh, bank statements. You will need to have a clean criminal record, um, you will uh, uh, need to effectively re uh, well live in Portugal. You can be absent from Portugal within the validity of the visa for a period of six months or eight non-consecutive months. Okay, uh, you will have to show that you have an accommodation in Portugal. This can be a property owned under your name or a tenancy agreement of at least one year. Uh, Lastly, you will need to have a medical insurance that will cover uh, Portugal. Now we can pass to the next slide. Um, in relation to the income requirements, as previously referred, uh, for the passive income is at least one minimum salary uh, per month. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, uh, proof of means of subsistence, you will have to show at least uh, 12 months of minimum salaries in Portugal in your bank account. For the main applicant, uh, this uh, is uh, the full uh, year of minimum salaries, so it's around 10,000 euros. For uh, the spouse, it will be half of this, so it's already around 5,000 euros, and for the children, less, around 2,500 euros. So depending on your family structure, you will need to show more or less um, uh, means of subsistence. But in any case, as you can see, it's quite minimal. Uh, and uh, uh, many people uh, would be in a position to uh, apply for this visa under these circumstances, as long as, of course, they have these minimum amounts of subsistence and passive income. We can pass to the next slide, please. So uh, just very briefly let you know how is the process itself. So it starts with uh, obtaining a first visa in the Portuguese consulate of your country of residency. So imagine if you are in Hong Kong to be the Portuguese consulate in Hong Kong. Uh, so this is the one in, in Macau. Or uh, if you are in Singapore, the Portuguese consulate in Singapore. Um, they will be the one vetting uh, the first documentation, so the, the the evidence of your passive income, the means of subsistence, the criminal records, and so on. They will study your uh, file first, uh, and once uh, they have you have the green light, uh, they will issue this first visa. This first visa will allow you to uh, go to Portugal. The visa has a period of four months and entitles two entries in Portugal for you within those four months to book your meeting with the Portuguese immigration so that the Portuguese immigration issues the residency permit. Uh, let's call it the D7 permit. Um, so uh, two steps, one in your country of residency and the second one already in Portugal to obtain uh, the residency permit. 
Next slide, please. Um, so this is just a, a visual um, uh, uh, images of your application. So you apply for the disable on your country of, of origin, as I just said, then you go to Portugal to SEF, the Immigration uh, Authority, uh, to do your biometrics meeting, and then they will issue the D7 uh, for you and for your family. Can we pass to the next slide then? Uh, in terms of timeline, so it starts uh, with the consulate. Uh, this can take uh, um, around uh, I would say three months, okay, two months, 60 days. And then uh, with uh, uh, the SCF, the meeting in Portugal, to issue your visa, it can take another uh, two months. Uh, this visa is renewed on the second year and then uh, every three years. On the fifth year, as I just mentioned before, you can apply for Portuguese citizenship or permanent residency. This is basically it in terms of the D7. Okay. Uh, I think that we don't have any other slides, right, Bella? No. Uh, so I'll be happy to respond to any questions you have at the end. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ter. So there's a few questions coming in. So we'll take those at the end. Um, so yeah, really, really insightful presentation to the to the D7 and the the opportunity there to uh, acquire um, the visa through that uh, through that route, um, and and certainly you know Terzo will be available for for one to one consultations, obviously based out of Hong Kong for for those who'd like to to get more information too. So um, yeah, so let's let's go on to the next part of the presentation. So I just want to spend a couple of minutes um, just as a high level overview for for the Portugal property market. Um, as I shared with you, I was there quite recently on the ground uh, ahead of our new launch in Porto, but uh, I just wanted to share some, some sort of background and context to the market. So if we look at an overview, so Portugal is in the top six countries in the world for foreign investments. Why is that? Um, well, you know, rule of law is good, crime is low. Um, you know, ease of doing business, um, infrastructure improvements in the last number of years, um, opportunity there um, is very strong. Um, and, you know, the fact is, um, and I'll share, I'll come on to this in more detail as we go through, is very limited supply from a, from a, from a property perspective. In fact, I'm going to share some of those numbers um, as we go through the presentation. It's very interesting uh, the sheer volume of undersupply, and this is partly due to um, uh, the uh, build costs going up, um, obviously the fact that planning rules and regulations are slower in today's world, partly because of sort of any energy efficiency ratings going up, etc. Um, and, and also the fact that in Portugal in particular, the market is much more regulated than it was back in the financial crisis when uh, Portugal unfortunately got particularly badly hit through that uh, through that time. Um, so, so what we've we seen in recent years, so we've seen property prices actually go up reasonably significantly, particularly between 2019 and 2022. Um, you know, that was partly, if you bear in mind that so many countries rebounded quite quickly after the financial crisis, Portugal took a lot longer. You know, you've had various impacts, for example, the golden visa that's impacted on property prices, etc. And we've seen some significant growth in recent years. But actually, there's been a there's been a report um, by the University of Munich recently in Germany stating that they expect that the Portuguese property market, believe it or not, will average around about eight percent per year over the next 10 years, uh, particularly in the major major cities such as Lisbon and Porto. Um, and that is kind of linked to um, the severe shortage of property being built. And, and certainly I think we see a lot of the growth coming from the influx of overseas migration, et cetera, good net worth individuals buying property. And, and, and obviously this is impacting on, on property prices. Um, so let's, um, let's go into the next slide, please, Bella. Um, so yeah, it is quite, um, fascinating the amount of undersupply in the property market. Now, bear in mind, obviously, Portugal, population of 10 million people. Um, 
up until sort of uh, between Jan and September 2022. In terms of house building, we only saw 14,000 new houses built during that period of time, which actually only represented a, a growth of around about 1.6% compared to the previous year. Um, and indeed, building permits for residential properties also experienced a 0.7% decline compared to 2021. So, you know, we're talking about significant undersupply versus the demand for property, the amount of sort of population movement towards Portugal that's not only come from, for example, Golden Visa, etc., but also comes from uh, other EU countries under the freedom of movement and, and individuals moving from, you know, be it Holland, France, Germany, etc., into major cities, investing in major cities um, into, into Portugal. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, please, Bella. So this is this for me is one of the key key slides here, and it's one of the reasons why over the long term we see very strong opportunity for growth uh, in property in Portugal. If you have a look at some of the stats here, it's quite amazing. So if you look at housing production in Portugal, in 2002, there were 120,000 residential units uh, built. Between 2013 and 2022, the same level, 120,000, was built over the whole of that nine-year period. So the point being here is that, you, you know, when you sort of come off the, the, um, the back of 2002, leading into the financial crisis, you know, property um, build really did fall off. And it wasn't until about sort of 20... 15 it actually started to started to pick up again um, and then in recent times it's kind of stalled as well because of build costs going up and because of um, uh, uh, interest rates going up which has affected the amount of property that's being built so as a context to that if you look at this year there's been around about 20,000 houses properties that have been built in 20. Uh, 23. Now compare that to 2002, over 20 years ago, where in one year it was 120,000. It's quite a significant difference uh, in terms of the amount of build. Quite, quite, uh, quite uh, fascinating statistics there. Uh, next slide, please, Bella. So how does that translate to to the rental market? Um, well, you know, with with limited supply and high uh, demand for housing, particularly in the major cities such as Lisbon and Porto, we've seen very, very strong rental increases between the last year or so. So this stat pulls up between September 2022 and September 2023. And, and, and you know, we are, we are very um, close to these type of statistics because we've recently had a project, for example, completing in Porto. So we're very familiar with how rents are um, uh, tracking upwards. So believe it or not, the biggest house rents um, between September 2022 and 2023, September in Porto, 34.6% increase, um, and in Lisbon, 32.9%. And there's a graph there which kind of tracks how it's gone over the last number of years. But as I say, in particular, you know, there is significant rental growth that we've seen uh, in the uh, two major cities, obviously the capital and the second city of Porto in Portugal. Next slide, please, Bella. So in terms of housing prices, what's impacted? Well, we talked about, you know, the previous growth. I think this year it's fair to say we've seen prices moderate. Um, again, partly that's with higher interest rates uh, having uh, had an impact. Um, but nevertheless, where some markets have completely stagnated, um, you know, buying a house in Portugal over the last 12 months has typically increased by just under 5%, um, but actually more significantly in the two major hubs of uh, Porto and Lisbon being 6.5% increases and 5.4% respectively. Next slide, please, Bella. So who's buying the property? Well, it's, it's essentially coming from foreign investment. So good net worth, high net worth individuals, um, 
good affordability, investing in a very undersupplied market, and you put the two together, and that's why you get the stats, for example, with the University of Munich projecting 8% year-on-year growth for, for sort of 10 years. So actually 61.3% uh, of Porto transactions were carried out by, by foreigners, just enhancing the strong demand from foreign nationals, which of course has impacted on uh, driving uh, prices up and affecting the, the overall uh, housing market uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in Portugal. Next slide, please, Bella. Okay, so just, just before I um, uh, sort of come to questions um, and um, that uh, there's a few coming in, obviously, for myself and Terzo. So I just wanted to, um, just to pause uh, in terms of the, um, uh, the other areas we're investing in. So here in the UK, uh, there's a strong focus. Um, yesterday, we've seen inflation go down to 4.9%. Um, as uh, FYI, that's halved in the last year. So we're starting to see um, talk of interest rate cuts in 2024. Um, and then across the country, where we're investing is um, projects in uh, Manchester and Sheffield that are completing quite soon, and projects in Edinburgh, Oxford and York that will be completing over the next year. From, from overseas, um, we're starting to see the currency stabilise here in the UK, um, and therefore um, potentially the currency has reached uh, the bottom for overseas investors, which is why we're seeing a lot more inquiries for UK property now and also given the strong rental market here. And then if I just touch on our, our second market, um, if we go on to Germany. So again, we talked about the supply crunch in uh, Portugal. It's exactly the same in Germany. Um, Germany typically has had 400,000 homes built between 1960 and 2020. This year, it's fallen down to 250,000 homes, a 40% drop just over the last couple of years. And again, it's it's due to um, slow planning rules, German um, high efficiency ratings for energy, uh, energy efficient ratings to be very high in German property, which means that it's a, it's a much more um, slower process to get build sign off. Um, and, um, you know, that's impacting on the amount of stock that's coming to market. And of course, interest rate rises and build costs have impacted on property coming to market. So we, um, we're very positive on Germany and we're focusing on um, Berlin and Leipzig uh, as our, our major opportunities. Um, and again, on here, if you'd like further information on Germany and the tax advantages there, uh, I'll be happy to share those with you. Um, and then finally, if we come on to Portugal, so we will be launching in Porto soon. We're launching here um, because of the fact that um, we've done earlier work in Porto. We've had a very successful um, first project. The units have rented out very quickly on two and three year contracts at um, very strong rents um, as, as shared in this presentation. And actually, as I shared with you, because obviously higher interest rates have impacted this year. We've been able to really buy in at a good time here. And as I shared with you, we underwrite these deals. We put our capital in, we bulk purchase. So we've managed to get some better value at this time, just as there is talk of interest rates coming down in the Eurozone next year. So we feel it's a really good time to re-enter the market on numerous levels. This project is just north of the city centre. It's a short hop into the city centre. Um, and in Portugal, there is great long um, low interest rates of around about 4% currently on offer too. So watch this space for that uh, new launch. Um, and as I say, do let me know if you've got further questions on any of these projects after the webinar. Um, so at that point, we'll go to questions because I know there's a few questions that are that are now coming in. Um, so I think there's there's one or two here for, for, for Terzo first up that's... Uh, that's coming in. Um, the first one is, so um, someone asked Terzo, is there a difference between the D7 and buying uh, property uh, previously when you could do for the golden visa?
Oh, you're just on mute, uh, Terzo. Yeah. Um, so uh, for the for the D seven, um, uh, the D seven, the nature of the D seven is not an investment visa. Okay. So for you to understand, uh, there is no requirement per se of purchasing the property. Okay. Normally people do because they go and live in Portugal and they buy their own properties. Okay. So there is no restriction whatsoever in terms of where that property is located and on the amount of uh, on, on the investment on the price of the property. So you are entitled to buy a property in Lisbon, for example, or Porto. Uh, and uh, uh, that property that was no longer available under the Golden Visa, as you know, because residential properties in Porto and Lisbon were excluded from the Golden Visa. So you can do it with the D7. And you don't need to buy a property at a certain limit amount of, of, of price point. You can buy a property that you like at any price, whatever you, you, you want it to be. Okay. I think that's a couple of really good points. Uh, you, the fact that you don't have that capital amount, you don't have to buy physical property. Um, you could have a 12 month uh, rental contract instead. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's. Um, uh, a, a really important point, and, and of course, the the actual uh, amount of income you require to so are actually relatively low, aren't they? Correct. So, uh, as I mentioned during the the presentation, it is linked to the minimum salary of Portugal. The minimum salary per month in Portugal is uh, uh, eight hundred euros. Okay, which is quite minimal, around eight hundred euros, eight hundred and twenty, starting now in two thousand twenty four. Uh, and the passive income is linked to that amount per month and the means of subsistence as well uh, on, a, on a yearly basis. So, uh, in fact, it is quite uh, a low amount and uh, it uh, basically allows many people to uh, benefit from this D7 visa. Okay. Okay. Mm. Okay, and then the next question is: um, Is there any sort of particular tax advantages to the to the D seven visa? Someone's asking. Well, the particular tax advantages on the D seven visa um, until now we still have the the NHR uh, tax regime, okay, which is still being negotiated under the budget law, <clears throat> which is going to be approved by the end of this month. Whether it is going to be maintained, changed or uh, revamp, okay? So under the current uh, NHR uh, regime, uh, there is uh, uh, tax benefits for uh, passive income holders in the sense that they are not taxed on the income that they have abroad, okay? And the income that they generate in Portugal is taxed at a lower tax rate as well. Okay, okay, that's, that's really good. Uh, information there on the on the tax side. Um, someone says, then someone's asking actually here, Terzo, is there any chance that the the D seven uh, could end at all, similar to, uh, for example, the golden visa ended for direct property investment. Of course, there are still other routes for the golden visa, but um, someone has asked, is there any chance that the D seven scheme could come to an end in the near future at all? So. Um... You, you, what, what you mentioned is just uh, correct. So the golden visa has not ended, so it's still uh, on with other types of investments. So this already shows that the government is not cutting on the visa routes. Uh, and this uh, is, of course, applicable to the D7 in its entirety. So the regime that we have now for the D7 is not expected to be cut at any moment, okay? And it's not in uh, in discussion. Uh, what happened was related to the golden visa, but not to the other visas that we have. And we have many other visas. Today we are focusing on the D7, but there are others that uh, are not uh, in the verge of being uh, ended. Okay, and another question actually for yourself. So, um, can I apply for the D7 in my own name and then potentially uh, join my children um, and my mother and father and my wife all to that same application? Is there any restrictions there at all? 
No, so uh, as I just mentioned, one of the one of the features of this uh, visa is the family reunification. And as long as you can prove that uh, your mother or father are dependents on you, uh, you can bring them on the application. The wife uh, is always possible and uh, the, the kids as well, the minor kids. Okay, that's great. Okay, that's all very clear. Um, okay, there's a couple of questions for myself here now. Um, okay, Portuguese interest rates, what are they currently? Well, okay, so we can currently get sort of longer term fixed rates from about 3.97%. Um, so in the context, for example, of other markets, that's very, very competitive. Um, so the 10 year fixed rates, um, those sort of um, interest rates. Um, OK, what are what are rental yields in in um, in Porto? Um, well, I can share with you that we're talking about around about sort of five percent yields. As I say, we've seen we've seen actual um, significant rental increases. Um, on our first uh, project that completed recently in Porto, allied to the data that I've shared here with regard to the undersupply in the market. So we're talking about, um, yeah, very healthy rental yields in the market. Um, okay, someone's asking here about what is the potential for, for capital appreciation long term. Um, as I shared with you, I think it's fair to say that, you know, the market has been uh, seen less growth this year, uh, particularly. That's because of the um, obviously interest rates coming up, et cetera. However, um, you know, the fact is, um, you know, with interest rates starting to stabilize now, with this incredible undersupply that we talk about and, and the population growth that we will continue to see, an investment from foreign investment into Portugal with good net worth individuals, we are very confident. Of, of significant growth. And it's why we've entered the market now, because where, where, where the market hasn't been as strong as it has been previously, we've been able to negotiate just a little bit better pricing when we underwrite the deal. So we feel it's a really good time to get in the market, particularly when the ECB is talking about potentially cutting rates next year. Um, and as I say, with all this undersupply and population growth that we, that we, that we look to see in the years ahead. And, um, as I say, we can refer back to that very positive report by the, um, uh, the University of Munich talking about the long term growth in Portugal around about 8% per annum for, for 10 years. Um, let's see. OK, there's a, one other question for yourself. How do I get Terzo's details uh, to speak with him? So, look, you can you can. Uh, obviously drop me a line after the webinar and I can I can connect you with with Terzo so that he can have a one-to-one. -one. Terzo's in uh, in Hong Kong, but he speaks to clients, you know, across the globe. So certainly I can uh, I can make the connection for you uh, to, to Terzo on that basis. Um, I think that's just about um, everything. I think that's the sort of final questions coming in there. So um, as I say, do watch your space for the um, for the new Porto launch. I will share that once that is uh, ready. That's from two fifty thousand euros. Um, Terzo, is there any sort of closing thoughts from yourself uh, in terms of um, you know, your side on the on the visa or anything else you'd like to add? Well, basically, I think we've covered the the, the main uh, features of the visa. Of course, uh, uh, I'm happy to 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 speak uh, with. Uh, Anyone that is interested in you know more in detail, um, maybe in relation to their own situation, uh, I'm fine to to do that. As you mentioned, I'm based here in Hong Kong, but uh, if uh, people prefer to speak in uh, um, European time zone, uh, someone from our office can also accommodate that. So I'm happy to do that. And thank you very much for having me uh, again here in your webinars. Grant. Thank you. No, it's great, Terzo. Thank you for joining. I know it's late into the evening there into Hong Kong. So thank you for joining. I mean, that's been very useful in terms of the overview you provided for D7. Uh, as I say, we can share the slides for anyone who'd like the slides. Um, and as I say, I can connect you with Terzo if you'd like to have a, a personalized one-to-one -one conversation. Um, hopefully this has been uh, useful for all attendees in terms of the 
the property market, how we see um, uh, the market in Portugal right now, following my recent trip, and also, um, you know, Terzo's uh, input in terms of the D7 visa option. So, again, Terzo, thank you for, for joining. Um, thank you for everyone who's attended this webinar. Do keep the questions coming in. We like to keep these sort of fairly concise, um, but do keep the questions coming in. And as I say, if you want me to connect you with Terzo, I will gladly do that. Um, and so all it remains me, for me to say is, uh, again, thank you for your attending. Good afternoon, good evening uh, to you all, and uh, look forward to speaking again soon. Thank you very much indeed.